that will include more as well. Now we would like to encourage everyone to share their comments, questions, um, any insights in our chat box so that we can have these discussions together. Today's meeting will be held in English and during the plenary, we request that you all engage in our conversations. And with that, good morning, everyone. And of course, welcome back to day two. Of course, this is all about Stockholm Plus 50 and bringing together working groups across the Asia Pacific. I'm Antoinette Toss, actor, singer, host, environmental advocate, and UNEP's National Goodwill Ambassador for the Philippines. Yesterday, we had a wonderful plenary where we had panelists representing various sectors who shared with us their reflections on the 50 years of environmental action and their visions and pledges for the next 50 years. Now, we, we reiterate once again that Stockholm Plus 50 is about reimagining, regeneration, recovery and rebalance, and of course, renewal. We also had two working group discussions that focused on ending plastic pollution and promoting sustainable food systems, which are very, very crucial issues, not only for this region, but for the entire world. We have sent an email as well to all registered participants with links to these working group jam boards. So in case you weren't able to join these working groups yesterday, first of all, you can watch these replays. There are links available online that will also be shared with you in the chat box. But more than that, these uh, working group jam boards are actually there for you to view, to see uh, the insights that people have already shared and you can still participate and add your own comments as well. So we really encourage everyone to check out um, your email uh, to see if you've received these links already. And we're also going to be sharing uh, the summaries for both day one and two with you all via email as well. And as also today is the last day of the consultation, we will also prepare an official report of everything reflecting your insights on the discussion. So not just, of course, uh, what was discussed, but your insights are crucial for this as well. These will also be sent via email and they will be updated online for wider public reach. Now, before we go into the plenary of day two, as promised, an interactive session is ahead of us, beginning with some poll questions that will help shape the dialogue and the narrative of the conversations and questions to come. We would like to ask uh, UNEP to please bring up poll question number one that we are encouraging each and every one of you to respond to so that we can get a good idea of where we are at in the Asia Pacific region. Do you think the Asia and the Pacific region is capable of taking bold action now to ensure a healthier planet in the future. Ready for your responses? And once we see some responses come in, we anticipate sharing the results with you as well right now. Some of the questions yesterday required three answers. This is just a yes or no answer. You can also check out the screens on your computer right now. The poll questions should be popping up automatically. Uh, there should be a separate window for that, just in case you haven't seen it yet. I'm going to answer as well <laughs> and participate. There you go, my answer has been shared. All right, I submitted my answer and we're anticipating more responses from each and every one of you. May I ask if um, our audience is able to receive these poll questions right now and able to open them up? Yes. Wonderful. Tech team, could we see the results? from poll question number one. Wow, <laughs> a whopping 94% uh, says that the Asia Pacific, uh, the Asia and the Pacific region is capable of taking bold action now to ensure a healthier planet in the future. And I feel maybe this 6% that we've got here is something that will be discussed today, why that is there. Now moving on to question number two, ready for poll number two? Team UNEP, there you go. In your opinion, how quickly do you think the Asia and the Pacific region is taking action to achieve a healthy planet and prosperity for all? Very fast, fast, neither fast nor slow, slow or very slow. Hmm. 
going to give everyone time to respond to this question. And UNEP, Team UNEP, if we have enough responses to this, if everybody's had the chance to respond to that, can we see the results of that question? Mm, so uh, the opinion from our session today indicates that we believe that we are going slow. The top answer is slow, 43%. We have 29% uh, following closely that says neither fast nor slow and followed by 16% at fast. All right, next poll question. Very easy to answer. What is your age? <laughs> I will give you guys, I guess we don't need much time to answer this. Unless some of us are contemplating how, we, how old we really are <laughs> based on how we feel inside. All right, UNEP, Team UNEP, can we see the responses to the age group? Ah, I believe 21% of our participants today, 45 to 54 years old, followed closely by 20%, pretty much a tie, 35 to 44 and, oh, I believe it changed. Okay, I'm sorry, those are the second placers. The leading age group in our session today, how wonderful, 31%, 25 to 34. So we see pretty much, this is uh, very much powered by the youth, this is incredible. Um, and once again, followed closely by 35 to 44 and 45 to 54. Now let's go on to the final question for our interactive poll. Team UNEP, beyond Stockholm Plus 50, what do you hope that the Stockholm Plus 50 international meeting achieves? And of course, this is not just for the meeting itself, but beyond it. Renewed and more ambitious commitments, strengthened multilateralism and trust, specific deliverables and actions, intergenerational cooperation, commitments for financial technology, support for a just transition or other. All right, let's view those results from Team UNEP. Okay, so coming in in first place, what we want to achieve beyond Stockholm plus 50, 51% actually says that they want it to be specific deliverables and actions. So we want it to be more specific and we want it to be actual actions. And then of course, followed closely 47% by strengthened multilateralism and trust. And in third at 44% by intergenerational cooperation, which is a topic that we also discussed yesterday. So we look forward to seeing more of the results of the polls from UNEP as well. Or maybe they can share some of that uh, with, with you all. And we'd like to thank you all so much for participating because these responses mean so much in uh, the narrative that we are going to be discussing today. And not just that, the framework that we are all trying to build together. Now, once again, we thank you for all of your participation and for joining us. Right now, we are moving in to plenary two, reimagine, which is intergenerational dialogue on visions of the future for a healthy planet and prosperity for all. So we just mentioned that even in the poll and it came in strong, I think a third, uh, which is today's plenary session is focusing on that intergenerational dialogue on visions of the future for a healthy planet and prosperity for all. Now intergenerational cooperation is one of the organizing principles of engagement for Stockholm plus 50, which is essential for all of us to meet the current generation's needs without compromising those of future generations. Just from that initial poll, I think we're already hitting some of those targets because today's participation clearly shows uh, that uh, most of us actually are part of the youth. Oh, I'm not a part of the youth anymore. I'm forgetting that. <laughs> but most of the participants today uh, for this plenary session, I will ask panelists two sets of questions and each panelist will be given two to three minutes to respond. We would also like to open the floor for some comments and questions towards the end of the plenary. So please do feel free to send those questions in in advance so that we can prepare them for our speakers today. We'd really like to encourage you to engage with us and we are grateful for your presence. Now, it's time to invite our panelists to the virtual platform. First, we are here with Mr. Clarence Gio Almoite, who is the Asia Pacific Regional Focal Point 
of the Children and Youth Major Group for UNEP. Clarence is very active in the regional and global UNEP discussions and is also the 2022 National Youth Icon elected by the Environmental Management Bureau of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources of the Philippines. Mr. Almoite, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for all that you do. Hi, uh, thanks Ms. Antoinette. And uh, on behalf of uh, Children and Youth Major Group of UNEP, eh, and that's well the Staff on Plus 50 Youth Task Force. Uh, we are very proud and honored to be here in the Asia Pacific Multi Stakeholder uh, Dialogue. And thanks as well to a uh, UNEP group in organizing this uh, consultation. Good day, Clarence, and thank you so much for being with us. Uh, direct to the first question What the future of work, what do you think the future of work looks like for the youth? Like, what are the new competencies the youth? will need to have to realize an ideal future? Well, uh, the effects of a poverty can, uh, we all know that it can go beyond economic chances, uh, depriving children and young people of their dreams and living some psychological wound. So we all know that young people around the world according to the United Nations, make up 16% of the world's total population. So it's about 2 billion. Some of us are starting to realize that uh, providing future generations a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment can equip us, children and youth, to be prepared in various arrangements of work, either on ground, professionally, or even in a voluntary manner. While we know that uh, while, you know, while we know of great examples of young people being given the right opportunities, we also need to find ways to scale up these success stories to build a more inclusive uh, world of work. Now, uh, young people are also aware that in order to keep functional with changing technologies, they will need to retain several times throughout their careers. Despite their concerns about the future of work, young people are aware of the challenges that lie ahead, particularly in terms of modern technology. However, when it comes to the value of school and academics in terms of future job preparedness, young people are significantly less enthusiastic since they are not given the right and just compensation and recognition in their field. Lastly, to better enhance the ideality of future for youth, most importantly, in the field of work and as well as advocacy, career counseling with uh, correct monitoring could be a reasonable strategy for conveying the overview of work available in different fields for children and youth. Working to support aspirations among all sectors of youth and realigning aspirations that are unlikely to be realized to be more uh, to more realistic alternatives. On the other hand, providing technical and soft skills training for youth can give them aspirations to do better, as well as boosting digital skills by scaling initiatives, not only in work, but also highlighting their advocacy towards nature and climate and having a relevance in their field of work. So I hope our uh, participants uh, grasp the idea of uh, the question. And thanks again, Ms. Antoinette, for the question. Wonderfully said. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Clarence Gio Almoite, for sharing with us the vision of a future that the youth would like to see. Truly inspiring. Let me now invite Ms. War Dorina from the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law, and Development in Thailand. Ms. Ward Arena has been working to address the challenges of a traditional model of development and has been actively promoting a transformative framework that aims to reduce inequalities between countries, between rich and poor, and between men and women. Good day to you, Ms. Ward Arena, and thank you for joining us. Hello, Antoinette. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm also really happy to be here. 
Uh, again, uh, my name is uh, Wadarina. I'm from APWLD, Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, and also part of the Women Major Group uh, in the UNEP. Yeah. Over to you again, Antoinette, for your question. Ms. Wadarina, uh, could you kindly share with us your vision of a climate, gender, and development justice where no one, especially women and girls, are left behind? Yes, thank you for that question. And I think that from what you heard, you know, like the issue of climate justice, gender justice and development justice, the term justice is very important. And then we actually, if you read the newest IPCC report, the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, uh, they, uh, in the IPCC report itself, they try to unpack what does it mean by justice or climate justice, which they say it includes three principles. One is redistributive justice, which refer to the reallocation of burden and benefits among individuals, nation, and generation. Two is about procedural justice, which refer to the who decide and participates in decision making. And then the third one is the recognition, which entails basic respect and robust engagement with and fair consideration of diverse culture and perspective. So right now, when we are talking about Stockholm plus 50, uh, we know it comes when a time there's an urgent need to correct the world's economic and social and environment uh, trajectory. And then we are talking now about the vision, but it's very important to acknowledge the root causes and driver to the problem, to the issue first, you know, which peoples and feminist movement like mine across the region repeatedly point to the profit-driven, market-driven, and best business as usual framework of the global capitalist economy. So any solution, any thinking, any vision that is actually cementing this framework will just make the women and communities further left behind, not just because women uh, are more vulnerable, but also because this very system is actually really depend and heavily relied by exclusion, exploitation, including women systemic discrimination in order to generate growth. For us, we actually offer also the concept of just and equitable transition. Many of you heard about just transition may maybe. We adding, uh, we also adding the feminist perspective on that, which is equitable. So it's not only about addressing inequalities within our economic system and shift away from a consumption-based extractive and exploitative economy, but also adding to that, recognizing that a transition to the economy must have gender benefits. And also adding feminist perspective to the concept provides the opportunity to completely rethink the very basis uh, of the existing imbalance and exploitative global economy and address the historical inequalities of gender division of labor that underpins our current model of development, which is neoliberal capitalism. So to do that, we need to actually prioritize uh, public funding of care, yeah? It's really, we need to know our vision is actually creating a low carbon just economy that deals with climate disruption and upholds uh, human rights will require an enormous increase in health and care workers. We need to look into the universal basic income or social wage. We need to also look at the concept of energy democracy, where actually the one who actually have a decision is actually women in the communities, not a centralized system of energy that are generally designed for profit and also resulting in burning as much as fossil fuel at the cheapest rate for industry. We also need to look at the issue how this just an equitable transition is also uh, 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 critical is the redistribution of land, which is like looking at how the industrial farming, logging and other land monopolies are large contributors to climate change and then also environmental degradation. And then small land holdings by women using agroecology principle can improve both soil securitization and then prevent erosion and other degradation through pollutants. So I'm. this is a, a very brief concept of the just and equitable transition that we 
we are offering. I'm going to give it back to you, Antoinette, uh, for maybe further question later. Thank you so much, Ms. Ward, Arena. And I mean, for two to three minutes, you really uh, gave us a good uh, insight and also a vision of the development justice that is inclusive and just. Indeed, the just transition is what we should also aspire to achieve. And as you mentioned, not just uh, considering it just, but equitable indeed. And as we talk about moving forward and achieving our goals together, we reiterate year after year, time and again, that how can we expect to achieve our collective goals for an entire world if half of the world is held back from opportunities to participate and to be a part and to champion these solutions? Next, I would like to turn another, uh, I would like to turn to another inspiring youth panelist for today. Uh, I'm honored to introduce Ms. Emanuela Shinta. She is a Dayak leader, activist, environmentalist, filmmaker and writer with a reputation for leading and empowering young indigenous people. She has trained more than 170 young indigenous filmmakers and directed 18 indigenous films. She is the founder of Ranu Wellum Foundation, International Indigenous Film Festival Network and a live global ministry which focuses on charity and healing. Good day and so wonderful to have you with us today, Miss Shinta. Thank you so much. Adil Catalino, Bacuramin Kasaruga, Basengat Kajubata, Arus, Arus, Arus. Greetings from Kalimantan. I'm Emanuela Shinta. I'm a Dayak woman from Kalimantan Island, and I'm so happy to see you here today. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, Miss Shinta, we would like to ask you, based on your experience, how do you think we can raise our public awareness on nature-based solutions and ecosystem approaches, including the vital work of indigenous peoples to achieve a nature positive and carbon neutral pollution-free future. Right, thank you. Um, before I answer the questions, I think we all need to think about this one rhetorical questions. How can the public become aware of the sustainable way of living of indigenous people and their, you know, like natural um, approach to the nature and so on, when they have been fed with all these misconceptions and the narrative for centuries about marginalizations, about the oppressions and violations of indigenous rights. You know, when we talk about, about indigenous people, most people will think about um, people who are marginalized, right? And they said, like, this is the stories that are being amplified for centuries, like, whether it is by writer or filmmakers or even uh, the researchers. So let's talk about how indigenous uh, people, you know, try to, to promote, I would say, like, not promote, like, but how we want to share our wisdoms and stories to the world. Actually, as the, the real challenge is with indigenous youth right now. So talk about the youth. Most youth, you know, like consumes the media. And if we talk about, hey, this is the way how indigenous people live. And then this is the sustainable way, the green way, you know, like uh, nature uh, based solutions. And they, how, how they will adopt it and accept it when what they see in the media is totally different things, you know, like it's all the victim stories and the sad stories. So I guess the answer here, we need to change the narrative first. You know, study from all of us here. We really need to think uh, about indigenous people um, differently and uh, try to correct all these misconceptions. And I need to tell you one thing that there is a lot of indigenous initiatives, the great works of indigenous communities at the grassroots level that need more exposure, actually. They need more publications. And only by, by doing this, we can learn right because from us me as an indigenous we don't recognize the word promote i mean what is the meaning to promote <laughs> about that but we as a community that think about the better future for all of us whether you are indigenous or not indigenous we have the same common goal so we really need to think about this so if you ask the questions about how can we raise the public awareness i will say first give the indigenous people or like indigenous communities on, from the grassroots level, the platform to share what they are doing. You know, it should be from their own mouth. 
in their own words, not from someone else's words, right? Because it will be different. It, it's different point of view. And then the second one, we need to support the media coverage of these indigenous initiatives, of these different or new narratives of indigenous people. That's why I'm doing a lot of media works. We capture the wisdoms from the elders, how to preserve the nature, how we live not in an exploitive way, you know, to the nature, because people need to see that, you know, like they need to see visually, listen, um, to the sounds of the nature by themselves and media is very good and effective way to do that especially now we are in digital era like when when you where you can access all the videos just very quick on your social media and then the third one we need to amplify this this new narrative you know that indigenous people are the guardians of the forest they have been maintaining the forest like for for thousand years so whether you are making a national policy about the land management or you are conducting a green projects or conservation effort, just consult to the local communities. Don't do it by yourself. It should be like bottom up approach because that's the only way we can do it right. I have seen so many distractions because of all these projects, you know, never consult indigenous people first. So we need to minimize it. And I really hope to achieve that by, you know, like through the Stockholm plus 50. And I, I have seen the different major shifting in the past 50 years. So I, I think, yeah, I'm optimistic for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, wonderful response, Nishinka, and for sharing your insights on not just awareness raising, but of course, once again, as we discuss and we uh, use the word inclusivity, uh, inclusivity doesn't just mean part of the conversation. It means being a part of the pathways forward. And as you mentioned, Nishinka, local communities, not just indigenous communities, but local action and local communities intertwined with pathways forward truly uh, is, a, is powerful in accelerating our transition to a more sustainable future. Now, last but not least, I would like to welcome Ms. Kushil Watene, who is an associate professor at Massey University in New Zealand. Her primary areas of expertise include mainstream theories of well-being and justice, obligations to future generations and indigenous philosophies. Ms. Watene, we are so grateful to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Tēnā koe, Antoinette, ngā mihi mai o haki a koutou i tēnei wā ko kushua wātene tēnei e mihi atu nei. He uri no Ngāti Manu, te hikatu Ngāti Whātou ora kei me tonga. Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm dialing in from Tāmaki in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is Auckland. Um, but I hail from the far north of New Zealand, a place called um, Taitokero. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for including me in this important event. Thank you, Ms. Watene. Welcome once again. And we would like to ask you, based on your areas of expertise and research, um, a vast uh, range of topics, what are some of the underrepresented traditions, community practices that offer an alternative and potentially transformative understanding of the human nature relationship? Kia ora. Yeah, so that's a huge question, but I think one useful place to start um, following on from Emanuela tēnā koe, ngā mihi, ngā mihi kia koe, um, is I think with Indigenous and other local communities that, that offer philosophies and related ways of thinking, which tend to begin with the idea that our socio-environmental relationships or how we relate to each other in the natural world, how such a focus can provide a a useful framework for rethinking, but also reorganizing how we live together, right? And this kind of starting point, um, I think draws attention to the way that our principles and our processes and our practices, you know, those things that tend to govern our interactions globally can really either enhance or diminish the quality of those relationships. And so a starting point like that, a relational starting point like that really forces us to ask, different kinds of questions, you know, are we relating well? Are we cultivating good relationships? Are we enabling good relationships? And these are, these are really important questions because when we recognize this relationality, when we take relationships as basic, we can see that 
relationships are really fundamental to how we think about responsibilities actually. And so indigenous philosophies really push the boundaries of our thinking um, about responsibilities and really extends the scope of those responsibilities in what I think are really transformative ways and multidimensional ways and, and intergenerational ways. Um, one of the ways in which this broadening of responsibilities is enacted is in terms of what you might call stewardship or intergenerational social environmental practices grounded in reciprocal relationships. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, we often refer to this as, as kaitiakitanga. And these practices are the result of, as Emanuela said, intimate place-based knowledge and its intergenerational transfer. And so they can include things like rich knowledge of how areas have changed over time, relationships between species, how sustainability can be practiced based on many thousands of years of stewardship. But the practices also rely on and include knowledge of innovation and future opportunities. That's really important, especially in the face of contemporary challenges. So such as, for instance, um, you know, practices and planning that may protect the community given climate-induced social and environmental change. So there's real insights globally from our local communities, actually. I think that's often forgotten. So I think recognizing the value of indigenous and other local communities and their practices for both local and global change is really vital, not just to justice, as um, Waradina also, Wadarina, sorry, also said, um, in all the dimensions of justice that she mentioned, but also our collective flourishing globally. Kia ora. Thank you very much, Ms. Watene. Indeed, I believe that what you've mentioned is in line with nature-based solutions that UNEP emphasizes to address environmental challenges that we are facing today. But once again, not just that, really nurturing these relationships and seeing the power uh, between uh, the collaboration between human and nature itself. We are going into our second round of questions today. And if you are just joining us, this is day two of Asia and the Pacific multi-stakeholder consultations for Stockholm Plus 50. We have gone through our first round of questions with our wonderful panelists and guests today. We encourage you to send in any questions or comments that you may have or that you would like to ask any of them. We shall try to answer them after this next round of questions before we end this session, or they can also address them directly in the chat box as well. So moving on to our second round of questions, for today, we move back to Mr. Almoite. Mr. Almoite, of course, is representing our youth as one of our panelists for today. And this question uh, is a follow-up from earlier. Uh, for the youth, what is the youth proposing that we do to promote intergenerational cooperation, as we've been mentioning is a focal point for today's discussion? And of course, how to ensure intergenerational equity in the regional environmental agenda. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. I think we have been uh, declaring and sharing this for over two years of virtual and in the recently concluded UNEA that uh, for us children and youth as well as the future generations to promote intergenerational cooperation and ensure intergenerational equity in the regional environmental agenda. First, uh, we uh, highly encourage, you know, we highly encourage member states and decision makers to adopt, to adopt a meaningful engagement, participation, and cooperation not only children and youth, but all the stakeholders as defined by the major groups and other stakeholders. Highlighting those most strongly affected uh, by the what's so-called the triple planetary crisis. We have children and youth, workers, vulnerable groups, uh, as well as indigenous peoples and their local communities. We also would like to highlight to increase investments in children and youth through the mitigation and adaptation programs for the Asia Pacific region. Also support to, uh, to civil society organizations and also young people who are working at grassroots level who are, let's say, uh, not much recognized. 
young entrepreneurs and uh, investing to them gives a leverage towards a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment for all. Uh, for the information of everyone, so we are building the Asia Pacific Youth Environment Caucus or APEC uh, that will focus on meaningfully engaging children and youth from all sub regions. Because as I noticed personally, uh, for Asia Pacific region, the most, not the whole, but a uh, majority of uh, the youth who are active came from South East, South Asia and Southeast Asia. So East Asia and Pacific region, we should highlight also their participation because they are as well one of the most vulnerable sub-regions in uh, the age in our region. And we are exploring to be connected to uh, UNEPRO, UNEP country offices, other UN entities, ministries of environment and development, as well as private sectors and other stakeholders who are working under the umbrella of environment, sustainability, and resilience. So not only UNEP, but also we have UNFCCC, the UNCCB, and other UN entities who are uh, working on this field. On the other hand, the Stockholm Plus 50 process entails the importance of accelerating the implementation of the environmental dimension of sustainable development, which is one of the main theme of the Stockholm Plus 50, where we highlighted meaningful, part, meaningful youth participation. I know we already shared this in the recently concluded 9th Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development in Bangkok, where we are present. And we would also like to reiterate that in the Stockholm Plus 50 pre-meeting convened in New York, a UNGA hall, delegations of children and youth have given opportunities to present interventions, present interventions on meaningful youth engagement on Stockholm Plus 50, and member states uh, applauded and supported the context, providing the ambassador of co-host Sweden while, address, uh, while addressing at the center of UNGA Hall and stated to all delegations of member states to, quote unquote, include youth in your delegations, include youth in member states' delegation, as we believe that Stockholm Plus 50 is the most inclusive international meeting in history, not only for government, not only for member states, but also to major groups and other stakeholders. And this will address concerns about intergenerational cooperation and equity. Lastly, we have a, a quote in the UNEA, the UNEA 5.2, where 40 youth are present. And we always say this, uh, hashtag the power in youth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clarence. And yes, we always try to say that as well. Youth got power. And thank you for emphasizing uh, the power of the youth. And not just that, um, the determination of today's youth to not just be voices, uh, but to actually be involved. As you mentioned, participatory action, being included in Pathways Forward. And it's wonderful to hear from a youth leader such as you, uh, that Stockholm plus 50 is already measuring to be one of the most inclusive meetings ever. And that definitely gives us hope. And not just that, that drive to push forth with courage, of course, together. And we move on to our uh, next question for our second round. Uh, moving back to Miss Wardarina. Miss Wardarina, in connection to your question um, earlier, uh, we would like to ask you, moving on from our youth uh, to women and girls, we know that women play a central role to transform our societies and bring new values, but how can we truly empower young girls to raise their voices and participate in the co-creation of a new paradigm? Thank you, Antoinette. And then before answering that on the how, right, I just let, let us go back a little bit on the empowerment and then how the notion of power is very important on that word, right? What does it mean? I mean, like if we are recognizing power and an understanding about it, it really compels us to recognize who is in power, yeah? Recognize the imbalance of power, 
This is what the feminist group always talking about. And also challenging the power structure that further left women and girl uh, behind. So if empowerment is ever mean anything, it really must look at and extend to strengthening girls' capacity to exercise their real power and control over their life on the terms which they want to engage with social and economic structure. And then that will never be happen without substantive equality and women's human rights. So this, the, the human rights are very, very important yeah, there's a, we need to actually first have a lot of political ed education on human rights and women human rights. Uh, it's, it's extremely important. And then we believe that equality, development justice, and the realization of women human rights can only happen when women, particularly girls, uh, marginalized women and girls, are empowered to lead policy and legal debates and determine solutions. We also need to actually have a space. Yeah, this is what actually the previous speaker also talking about. We need to have a meaningful space. is a very important part uh, of 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 how how to actually empowering uh, the young girls to create democratic space mechanism for women and girls for them to identify the issue, the problem, and also offer the solution. And then again, when I said democratic it will not be democratic if it's not challenging or readjust power within that system. We also want to, uh, therefore, I think that we there are some thinking about multi-stakeholderism when we are talking about multi-stakeholder partnership or multi-stakeholder approach. We need to ask ourselves, even in the Stockholm Plus 50 and UNEP, we need to ask who's holding most power of the agenda in what benefit is it imbalanced and who get access? For me, I think the most important partnership is the partnership with the community. I think the previous speaker already spoke about it. The most essential ingredient of any partnership is consent, continuous consent, engagement and trust of the people. And then genuine partnerships can only exist and can work where we share solidarity, shared objective and vision. So partners that come in other reason to make money, to exploit resources, to gain power cannot be part of the heart of the partnership if our objective is to actually create a healthy planet for all. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Andre. Wow, um, truly powerful response to that. Thank you for sharing uh, those insights, Ms. Wardarina, truly valuable and something that we hope will really become a part of the common narrative moving forward, uh, being able to not just allow girls or youth or other sectors of society, everyone to be able to realize their visions and hopes and dreams for a better future and to be able to be a part of these solutions and pathways forward. We all want that for each other. And of course, we move forward to Ms. Shitan. Ms. Shitan, going back to you and connecting once again to what we, as Shinta, what we discussed earlier, we would like uh, to hear from you uh, how you think we can ensure that Stockholm plus 50 renews the promise and optimism of 1972 and rebuilds the trust needed for the strength and cooperation and partnership, including the voices and ideas of youth, women, and indigenous peoples, specifically when it comes to policy making. Mm -hmm. um, I think I want to highlight uh, the two words here. Like first is trust, right? Uh, I think uh, previous speakers also talk about the trust. You know, um, right now there is a critical view of the indigenous community especially on the grassroots level you know like with trust especially when it comes to you know like working together with let's say ngos or maybe some government institutions the over the nature best solutions or green projects or conservation and so on why because there have been many you know like but the impact is almost zero People are still suffering, still affected by the climate change. And they are the first to be affected when any environmental disasters happen. Why? Because this all, let's say like projects or um, 
whatever the being overt to to people you know uh it's not based on what people really need and what they really want it's just an alien concept being forced to them under the name of green development all right so there is a broken trust here so talking about um what we want to see in the stockholm plus 50 i really i really want to highlight this word trust you know um whether you are an indigenous or you are from um government or you are from different stakeholders we need to highlight this word trust between the people between the communities within the different stakeholders and then the second one that i want to highlight is partnership we talk about the cooperation and partnership partnership should be equal it's not like one higher than else you know uh, it's not like hey because you have the money the over us um, a project you know you do a lot of things in our territory and then you can just dictate hey this is the best way for you to have a better life hey just do it this will improve your life just seem like what i said previously it's just alien concept and and it's real you know it's happening it's happening right uh, among the community so the partnership should be equal it should be like give and take right you and i are equal in this effort in this collective effort there is not such a thing like indigenous people as the vulnerable one as the most affected by the climate change um need like desperately need help you know <laughs> maybe i'm a bit critical about it but this is the real thing you know so now we need to to envisions uh stockholm plus 50 whether it is in the, the in the discussions in the uh, policy making progress you know like all the process that we do where different um many various stakeholders involved in that discussions we really need to hold on tightly into these two words trust and partnership because this is the only way for us to see the change the major change uh, for the upcoming meeting or maybe maybe other meetings that whether it is international or national or regional or local whatever it is uh, these two things we really need to to commit into that i think that's all that i can say thank you so much thank you so much Mishinta, for the wonderful reply as well actually today i can't echo enough everybody's incredible insights responses comments suggestions um, all of these things are really, truly powerful for leading us forward. But just to reiterate what Nishinka had mentioned right now, uh, as we look at those that possibly need our help, whether we need to help um, women and girls, indigenous communities, or other sectors that need to have a more participation, elevated participation in partnerships and action, we really need to start looking as, as it as not offering help to them, but us actually bringing them in because we need them. We need everyone everywhere to solve our collective issues and to build a better world. So it's not really just about helping. It's really about bringing everyone together to bring our superpowers together from each sector so that we can all contribute towards building a better world for all. And moving on, of course, last but not least, uh, we return to Miss Watene for a final question before we move on to today's working group sessions. Ms. Watene, uh, we would like to uh, give you a follow-up question and, and ask you, how do you think we can create a new narrative for a positive vision of the future and to empower indigenous peoples, youth and citizens in general for the transformative change that we truly need? Kia ora, kia ora anō. So yeah, another big question. I think um, the short answer would be in all the ways that that our panelists have already mentioned, but I also think there's something to gain from developments in law too, particularly around the rights of nature movement. Um, one example is the Te Ure Wera Act in New Zealand, which grants legal protection to a forested area to recognize, to strengthen and enable the relationship between this forested area and the indigenous communities. Um, but also the background to the act uh, really powerfully details the value of the forested area Te Ure Wera in its own right as well as the importance of enabling and strengthening um, human nature relationships in their, in their diverse and multiple layers and more broadly understood. Significant too, I think, is the importance of 
in the act, the way in which it recognizes the role of the philosophies, practices, and processes of the people of, of the local communities, the indigenous communities of the area, the Tuhoi people, as stewards. Um, and so the background to the act, for instance, describes the forested area as ancient and enduring, alive with history, abundant with mystery, and and something that really inspires people to commit to its care. And that is setting a different kind of narrative for the way in which we relate to nature and the, the value of nature in our lives. Um, but also the whole idea of, of um, this act and other, and other um, documents is to really center the natural environment. It's also about working together in ways that I think recognize different contexts, different values and different knowledge systems. And so, these kinds of commitments, in this case, legal ones, to work together um, in real partnership, go some way to recognizing, I think, the rights of indigenous and other local communities, um, their philosophies, recognizing their philosophies, um, and their deep connections to, to things like land and waterways. Um, I think the pursuit of our, uh, the pursuit and realization of our global goals are really intimately connected to and really dependent on local communities, on transdisciplinary engagement, conversations between generations, um, and that reducing what you might call this epistemic gap in our system between these different communities really requires urgent attention. Um, so seeing indigenous communities, for instance, and, or other, and other local communities, not just as passive recipients of change in the world, but active communities um, engaged in reforms and capable of being part of reforms and driving them. Um, and when we can do that, because this is a people problem, when we can do that, I think we can start to further bring to life this notion that we're all part of a much larger journey of intergenerational and planetary well-being. And if we can imagine ourselves as being being an important part of that larger story or legacy together, then, then I think we can start to cultivate collective transformation and, and even empowerment. I saw a little note in the, um, in the chat about that, in the face of radical change in the world. Kia ora. Thank you very much, Miss Watene. And we can't thank our participants and guests um, today enough for joining this interactive discussion. Um, truly, we've discussed a number of powerful words that have become key words for today that, of course, we say they can't just be defined simply. When we say the word empowerment, that cascades into so many different layers and definitions when we speak of inclusivity, of equity, um, and of course, nature-based solutions as well. And not just that, partnerships and solutions where everyone truly, really, genuinely feels that they are able to give the best capacities that they have and participate equally, not just in conversations, but in actions, solutions, and pathways forward. Uh, once again, we are thankful to everyone that joined us today, to our dear guest speakers. Thank you for all that you do to help build a better world. Uh, we can't thank you enough. We honor you and we salute you. And to our participants here today, we are not done. So we actually have prepared three special working groups for you today that you can join right now. So it gets deeper, more detailed, more interactive. Um, we had two yesterday, today there will be three. Working group number three today is called Regeneration, a healthy planet and prosperity for all. And we are honored to have as co-facilitators, of course, Executive Director Teresa Mundita Lim of the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity and Ms. Joan Carling, from the Asia Indigenous People Pact or AIPP. And for working group four, uh, the topic there will be recovery and rebalance, a sustainable and inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now for that session, uh, we are honored to have with us as co-facilitators, um, Aida Karazanova of the Economic Affairs uh, Officer of ESCAP. And of course, the head of mission in Mongolia for Caritas, Jana Zilkova, thank you so much for being with us today and for the honor of facilitating working group four. And for working group five, we have renewal, which is accelerating the implementation of the environmental dimension of sustainable development. Of course, with co-facilitators, we are honored to have with us Mr. Manjit Rakal, representing the LDC chair and group, and Ms. Pooja Ranga. Prasad of the Society for International Development, or SID. Uh, you can select your uh, preferred working group in the chat. 
Um, some may be assigned, but you can either find it in the chat or uh, select one of the options on your screen. The three dots that actually say more that can help uh, lead you to these working groups as well. We encourage you to send in your questions, anything that you would like to inquire about, and of course, to participate. As we mentioned, Stockholm Plus 50 is the most inclusive conference and meeting to date, and that brings us so much hope. So your participation truly matters. Now with this, I would like to conclude today's plenary. I am honored and grateful to have been your facilitator for these past two days. I'm Antoine Toss, UNEP Goodwill Ambassador, and we sincerely once again thank our panelists for their valuable contribution, as well as the audience for your engagement. As we mentioned, intergenerational dialogue and cooperation are key elements in ensuring that we meet our generation's needs without sacrificing the ability of the future generations to meet theirs. We have gained some great insights today, which will surely add value to the global discussions and actions coming forward. Together, let's reimagine, regenerate, recover, rebalance, and renew our only home planet for each other and all those that depend on it. Good day to you all. Good morning, everybody who, uh, for those who are still in plenary, you can choose your working groups, please. And then you will be moved virtually to the different working groups. Thanks. Hello everyone, I just wanted to share a tip on how you can join the working groups. Uh, you can also check uh, the options on your Zoom panel. There should be one with three dots that says more. And, and when you tap that, you should be able to see something that says breakout rooms. I'm not quite sure if that should pop up there. If not, um, there should be other options as well uh, available to you, depending on the system that you have. But you should be able to choose the breakout rooms that way as well. And you can stay tuned for more updates in our chat box as well. Um, our team from UNEP can assist you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Antoinette. James, can I kindly ask you to uh, share on the screen the, the slide with the working groups? Okay, we will do shortly.
Good morning to all the panelists that are in plenary. We are just starting uh, the working groups. You can see on the screen the different working groups that you can join together. There is an icon when you can select your working group. If you can see my screen, you can select the working group you want to be on. Working group three, regeneration, you can join here if you can see my screen. Working group four and working group five. Thank you.
Thank you to those who joined back in the plenary. There will uh, not be a closing plenary session. So thank you for successfully concluding the working group. We really appreciate your contribution, which will be reflected in the uh, final report. And um, you are now free to leave. Thank you very much for your contribution. Everybody have a great day.
Hello, everyone who is staying in the plenary. Um, please be informed that the consultation is now concluded. We really appreciate your participation and your active engagement. The report, official report, will be shared with you shortly and will be available on the website as well. Thank you very much.